us live now. Great. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, this is Appropriations and Financial Affairs in the Maine Legislature. And we are here this morning to get a briefing from the Revenue Forecast Committee, um, which is the nonpartisan professional staff um, committee that works with the larger economic forecasting committee um, to look at data and trends for um, economic activity in Maine uh, and nationally in the next handful of years. And um, then they give us their um, very best uh, data-driven and nonpartisan forecasts for what they think state revenues will look like um, in the next, well, between now and the next time they do this, which would be in December. So it's done in six month intervals, but it's also, um, the forecast goes through the end of this fiscal year, through the next biennium and the one after that. Um, I'm saying that because um, this is a, there are a lot of new people on appropriations this, this year. Um, and this is probably the first time some of you will be participating in a meeting like this and getting briefed. So I'm just trying to kind of set the time frames here. Um, so before we get started with our distinguished guests, um, why don't we start with introducing ourselves to the public? And um, I will start with Representative Fecto. Good morning, everyone. I'm Justin Fecto, and I represent House District 86, which is part of Augusta. Representative Cloutier. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am Kristen Cloutier. I represent House District 60, which is part of my hometown of Lewiston. Uh, Representative Arada. Good morning. My name is Amy Arada, and I represent House District 65, which includes New Gloucester and part of Poland. And my co colleague right here is on Zoom with me, and he'd like to introduce himself as well. Wonderful. Morning, I'm Solon Millet, House District 71, uh, towns of Norway, Sweden, Waterford, West Paris. We're having a little computer problem, but with Mandy's here to fix it. Thank you. Terrific. Um, Representative Fay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Representative Jessica Fay. I represent House District 66, which is parts of the towns of Casco, Poland, and Raymond. Uh, Representative Cardone. Hello, I'm Barbara Cardone. I represent House District 127, which is part of Bangor. Representative Hymanson. Good morning. I'm Representative Patty Hymanson, representing House District 4, which is parts of York, Wells, Sanford, and all of Algonquin. Uh, Senator Davis. Good morning, everybody. My name is Paul Davis. I represent Senate District 4, which is all of Piscataquis County and parts of Somerset and Penobscot. And Senator Davis, if you can lend some of your tech expertise to uh, your 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 uh, colleague, Representative Millet, that would be great. I will try. It's a bit of a struggle <laughs> without trying. <laughs> <laughs> um, Senator Bailey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Senator Donna Bailey. I represent District 31, which is Saco, Old Orchard Beach, Hollis, Lemington, and part of Buxton. Uh, my good co-chair, Representative Purse. Good morning, I'm Teresa Purse. I represent House District 44, which is the majority of Falmouth, and I serve as the House Chair of Appropriations. Great to see everybody. And I am Kathy Breen. I represent six and a half communities in Cumberland County in the Maine Senate, and I serve as Senate Chair of Appropriations and Financial Affairs. So, um, it's Monday in Zoom land and uh, we all have a few um, bugs to work out, but we will proceed. Um, and also I'll just say to members of the public that um, some of our members are not here because they are off in other committees uh, working on their own bills or, um, or what have you. So um, you'll see the, many of us uh, popping in and out as we proceed. 
Um, so I would like to um, invite our uh, guest, Christopher Nolan, who is also the head of the Office of, oh, and uh, Representative Martin is gonna be arriving, um, here to begin the Revenue Forecasting Committee report. Um, Mr. Nolan, is that, are you gonna lead this or um, Director Richter, what's, what's your plan? Um, I think, uh... Director Mike Allen was uh, going to lead it, but I think we were maybe starting with a summary of the economic forecast from uh, the state economist, Amanda Rector. Wonderful. If that's okay. Yes. Um, Representative Martin, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, good morning, John Martin, House District 151, Northwestern Arusta County. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, um, the Revenue Forecasting Committee works uh, hand in hand with the Economic Forecasting Committee and our state economist, Amanda Rector is here and um, she will be sort of framing the big picture of what the economic forecast looks like. And then we will move uh, to more into more detail about the revenue forecast. So welcome, um, Amanda Rector, state economist, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I don't have a formal uh, written out um, testimony to give to you, but I am going to refer back to the Consensus Economic Forecasting Commission report, which hopefully everyone has had a chance to see. If you have not, um, it is available, I think, both on the Consensus Economic Forecasting Commission's website and probably also on the Revenue Forecasting Committee's website. So just to remind everyone, and I appreciate Senator Breen's introduction to the commission, the Consensus Economic Forecasting Commission is made up of five independent economists. Um, they meet twice a year to update their forecasts. Their most recent meeting was in late March. It was actually the very end of March for an April 1st forecast update. And at that meeting, they considered what they had previously forecast at their November 1st forecast update, along with new information that had been received since then, both in terms of some actual data that had been released on a preliminary basis in 2020, and then also the updated forecasts that they look at. And they started out, and I'm gonna start out just going through the assumptions that they made for their latest April 1st forecast, because I think those assumptions really help give an understanding of what the numbers are. And then I'll go through the numbers quickly following that. Um, but I'm going to run through, I think they've got about seven or eight different assumptions. And I am going to read these out because I think that those are really important um, foundations of their forecast. This is on, I believe, page seven of their forecast report if you want to follow along at home. So with the economic recovery underway, concerns remain that this recovery is uneven across different sectors and demographic and socioeconomic groups. So they're really looking at how, in that one, how this recovery is sort of being seen in different ways depending on which industry sector you're in, which business you're in, and then also which demographic and socioeconomic group you're in. Although infection rates remain high, public health concerns will subside with the continuation of vaccine rollout. Continued social distancing, testing, and contact tracing will help the state mitigate the onset of COVID-19 variants. Federal stimulus and prolonged low interest rates will boost consumption and aid in the economic recovery. The service sector and tourism in particular may see increased demand during the summer. And I'll just note on that federal stimulus piece, one of the big changes between the two forecasts was that when they met at the end of October, they thought that there would likely be some federal stimulus in this calendar year, 2021, but they didn't know exactly how much or when exactly that would roll out. Um, and then, when they met more recently, of course, that had a lot more certainty to it. They knew that the federal stimulus package had passed the American Rescue Plan um, and what 
a lot of sort of the scale of that stimulus. Long-term structural changes are likely to occur as the labor market faces a skills mismatch. The availability of regular in-person childcare and K through 12 education will remain a major determinant in returning labor force participation rates to normal levels. The commission is optimistic that there's an opportunity for Maine to see increased in-migration in the coming years as telework becomes part of the new normal and people look for less densely populated places to live. Uh, however, this does have implications on the commercial real estate front, particularly for office space. And the supply of housing is extremely limited and may be a constraint on continued home sales growth. Human behavior underpins several key uncertainties at this time, including vaccination uptake, how willing people are to go out and get a vaccination, willingness to continue to adhere to social distancing procedures, and eventual willingness to return to normal activity once it is considered safe to do so. Additionally, pent up demand for services, for example, um, restaurants and hospitality, travel, arts and entertainment, um, pent up demand for those services may lead to a substitution away from purchases of goods. And then finally, labor force constraints may be a risk if pent up demand for tourism and services exceeds Maine's supply of workers, particularly if temporary workers are not able to travel to Maine for the summer tourism season. Uh, they did say that this may be mitigated somewhat on the lodging side if transient rental platforms, the sort of individual uh, rental of private uh, cabins, camps, apartments, houses, uh, if that is seen by visitors as preferable to some of the traditional lodging facilities. Overall, I think that the Consensus Economic Forecasting Commission or the CEFC um, saw a lot more certainty in a lot of the different aspects of what they had been considering prior to um, the most recent update. Uh, and overall, I think they were feeling a little more optimistic than when they had last met at the end of October. Um, several different uh, pieces of the information that they considered, particularly in terms of the 2020 preliminary actual data, um, came in a, a lot better than what they had been forecasting at their previous meeting. So let me just run through the actual forecast numbers here. Um, and then I can take any questions at that point. In terms of some of the key indicators that they're looking at, um, wage and salary employment uh, was previously forecast to decline 8% in 2020. The actual number that came in was a decline of just 6.4%, which yes, 6.4% decline is still a lot, but certainly not as bad as an 8% decline. They were coming off of a um, slightly higher base for their remaining forecast years. They left their forecast for 2021 unchanged at 4% growth. And then they increased their forecast for 2022 growth to 2.3% from 2.0%. And then their forecast for 2023, they increased from 0.1% to 0.7% growth. Uh, and these are all calendar years. I'll just note that um, as well. 2024 and 2025, they left unchanged at 0.1%. So this brings their forecast for employment back to pre-pandemic levels um, by 2023, whereas in the previous forecast, they actually did not reach pre-pandemic levels through their entire forecast <laughs> period. For total personal income, which is the, the total personal income for the whole state, it's not um, individual or household income. Their previous forecast for 2020 was growth of 5.3%. That was really driven by growth in personal current transfer receipts, which is money that gets transferred from a government to an individual. That included things like the stimulus payments, um, the enhanced unemployment insurance benefits and overall increased unemployment insurance that was being paid out. Um, some of the Paycheck Protection Program funds ended up in that line as well. Uh, but that growth led to an overall growth in the total personal income. Their previous forecast, as I said, was 5.3% for 2020. 
the preliminary actual came in at 7.6%, so even higher than what they had been uh, forecasting previously. For 2021, their previous forecast was a decline of 0.5%, and that was based on the fact that while they thought there would be some stimulus this year, they didn't know exactly how much it would be. They certainly didn't anticipate it being as robust as it was. And so relative to 2020, 2021 would have seen sort of an unwinding of that federal stimulus. Instead, with the federal stimulus package that passed um, and the size of that and sort of having that roll out over a longer mm -hmm. period, their forecast for 2021 is now growth of 5.0%. So they went from a negative 0.5 to a positive 5.0. For 2022, their forecast declined. It was previously positive 3.9%, which was sort of returning to a normal personal income growth forecast. Um, it's positive 0.2% in the most recent one. And that's because you're seeing that stimulus from this year unwind. Now it still is growing overall, but it's not growing as much as their previous forecast had been because we've sort of shifted the timing of when that stimulus um, was unwinding. And then the remaining years, they also uh, revised their <coughs> forecast up from 3.9% in 2023 to 4.1%, from 39 to 4.3 in 2024, and then from 4.0 to 4.5 in 2025. The forecast for wage and salary income, which is the largest component of that total personal income forecast, went from negative 1.5 in 2020 to positive 1.4. And that was based on the revi the preliminary actual data that was released prior to their meeting. For 2021, they revised their forecast up from 3.0% to 5.0%. And then they left their remaining years of that forecast unchanged at 4.0% growth. And then the last thing that I'll just touch on briefly is their forecast for inflation. They use the consumer price index CPI measure. The, their forecast for 2020 was 1.3%. That came in just a little bit below that at 1.2% for the actual. They revised their forecast for 2021 up from 2.2% to 2.4%. Supply chain constraints have become uh, more of an issue in recent months. And so they've seen uh, a little bit stronger inflation because of that. And then they left their remaining forecast for CPI unchanged. So it's at 2.2% in 22, 2.1% in 23, 2.1% in 24, and 2.1% in 2025. And that is trying to target the Federal Reserve Bank's long run 2% um, average inflation. So their forecast is having it run a little bit higher because it's been a little bit lower the past few years. questions on any of that. Thank you very much, Ms. Rector. Are there any questions from the committee for Ms. Rector? If you haven't noticed, um, the uh, Maureen popped the uh, report into our chat. Um, Representative Hymanson. Yeah, thanks for being here. Can you talk a little more about the supply chain um, issue that you're you're, you mentioned and I've been hearing about too. <clears throat> and, sure, um, yes, it's, it's shown up a bit more in the, the news lately. Um, it's, there are a lot of different parts of the supply chain that have been seeing some constraints um, for a few different reasons. And so there, there are certainly some constraints um, that are related to some uh, COVID-related closures and some weather-related closures. Um, by and large, some of the largest impacted industries that are sort of reflected in this forecast are related to some of the constraints around building supplies. Home building has been uh, booming lately, if anybody didn't notice. And so the supplies of those um, home building uh, lumber and plywood and all sorts of other things that you need to 
to construction, new construction, repairs, all of that um, has been seeing a lot of constraints. And so that's one of the pieces. Um, another piece is the semiconductors and chips that go into automobiles are causing a lot of constraints in um, the availability of autos for sale and also that's starting to impact some of the um, availability of rental vehicles as well. Uh, that's another piece of this. Um, and then there are, of course, some of the existing constraints that were already in the supply chain around some of the related to some of the steel tariffs. And so ma manufacturers are seeing constraints in some areas. Um, I think that, you know, in the long run, those will work themselves out. I think the concern that the commission has is what happens in the short term? Are we able to continue to provide enough supply to meet the demand or is that supply going to act as a constraint on growth before it can sort of catch back up to where demand is? There's another question um, about the work workforce shortage. What kind of constraint yeah. do you see that Right. And, and that's the other piece of this. I mean, that's the that's another supply chain. It's just the supply of labor rather than the supply of materials. Um, and that, you know, they mentioned that in their assumptions was that they are seeing, particularly over the summer, the lack of availability of workforce as a constraint. Certainly the, the leisure and hospitality industry had been sort of grappling with that even before the pandemic. And there are other industries. Construction is one. Um, I mean, labor force constraints were a big issue before the pandemic and, and they're continuing to be a problem now. I think that um, one of their concerns is in terms of people being able to rejoin the workforce because of childcare and elder care issues as well. And so that was one of the things that they mentioned around having schools and childcare open and available so that um, people who do have uh, the need for those are able to rejoin the workforce and know that their children are being uh, appropriately cared for on a regular basis. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions for um, Ms. Rector? Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Always a pleasure to hear from you. Um, and you're, you're a little more um, positive this time than the last few times we've been together. <laughs> yes, I think that was one of the takeaways from the CEFC's meeting was that they were definitely feeling more optimistic than they were feeling at the end of October. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think now um, I will invite um, Dr. Michael Allen, who's the director of the Maine Revenue Service, uh, to come on and um, walk us through the Revenue Forecasting Committee report. Um, Mr. Nolan, if you're trying to speak, you're on mute and we can't see you. Uh, I was not trying to speak, but. Oh, your box lit up like oh. you were. Sorry. Um, I'll keep it quiet. Lose, did we lose Mr. Allen? Uh, I don't I see I, him. He was on there, but I don't see him. He was. Um, I hope he comes back shortly. Uh, maybe while we're waiting for him, those members of the RFC that are on could just uh, turn on and uh, identify themselves, if that's okay. Great idea. Okay. Uh, why don't you start, Mr. Nolan, and then we'll go to Mr. Sear. Uh, yes, I'm Chris Nolan. I'm uh, the Director of the Office of Fiscal and Program Review, and I'm a member of the Revenue Forecasting Committee. And I'm Mike. Mark I'm Mike Sear. 
I'm Mike Sear, Principal Analyst in the Office of Fiscal and Program Review and a member of the Revenue Forecasting Committee. And Ms. Rector, you're also on the committee? Yes, uh, Amanda Rector, our state economist, and I, in addition to providing staff support for the Consensus Economic Forecasting Commission, I sit on the Revenue Forecasting Committee. So we will give um, Dr. Allen a minute or so to rejoin us. And I don't see uh, Beth Ashcroft, who's the state budget officer, is also uh, a member of the Revenue Forecasting Committee, as is Mike Allen, who is currently the Director of the Revenue Forecasting Committee. Thank you. Chair. Sorry. And Jim Brees is not here either. Jim is an economist for the University of Maine. Thank you, Mark. Uh, he said he just lost power and is getting back on now. So. Okay. Well, it wouldn't be Monday morning on Zoom if this all went without any glitches. For anyone who's interested, um, and I put the link to the um, Revenue Forecasting Committee page in the chat if you're, since we have a few minutes. Sure, and I can, if it's okay, Madam Chair, I can just kind of go through what the documents are there that we have posted. Um, sure thing, go right ahead. Gets on. So we released on, well, we met on the 27th. Um, and then we had another brief meeting on the 30th and um, just to get an update on some additional information, which we'll, we'll go over with you. Um, and so we released on later in the afternoon on Friday, a memo, a three page memo, um, just kind of explaining uh, what our findings were. Uh, we also have a number of documents um, that we, uh, that kind of summarize those findings and those are also um, on our website. So the memo's there and hopefully it was uh, sent to all of you directly on Friday. And then the documents uh, that make up uh, a good part of the report. And so we are in the process of actually drafting the report, which includes a great deal of additional appendices, et cetera. So, um, it takes us a, a bit of time to pull that all together, but we'll hopefully have that done in the next couple of days. So that memo um, you have and those documents um, are all on the RFC webpage. Um, we could uh, send you those directly if, you, if, you, if that's not a, a good way to get them for you. So, um, but the memo goes through and explains uh, the basis for our uh, revised estimates. Um, so that's, and then we also want to talk today about the, uh, the impact on general fund status, um, as well. So we'll talk about that at the plan. We'll also talk about that at the end of, 
uh, the presentation today. So it looks like uh, Dr. Allen is back, or coming back. <clears throat> so I won't break into song. Oh, shoot. Right. We're right on the cusp. Can you hear Dr. me? Dr. Allen, thank <laughs> goodness you're here. Mr. Nolan was about to start singing and we're so glad that you and Portland Head Light are, are with us. It's his dancing I heard that is really the highlight of his ability. So can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome okay. back. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. It literally, as you were sending it to me, <laughs> the power went out. <laughs> And it didn't I said, that. I said, and here's Dr. Allen. And then there, <laughs> and then there was nothing. So welcome back. Thank you. Good morning. Um, what I thought I would do is just, I, I, hopefully you have the letter that the revenue forecasting committee sent out last uh, Friday in front of you and available. And I thought I'd just kind of skim through that, hit the highlights and then open it up for questions from committee members. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to do before I begin is just uh, let people know. So I'm, I'm Michael Allen, I'm uh, Associate Commissioner for Tax Policy and the current chair of the Revenue Forecasting Committee. We have Chris Nolan, uh, who, who you obviously know, who's a member um, of the Revenue per Forecasting pardon me, Committee. Dr. Allen, one of the ways we filled the time when you were missing was we had the RFC members oh, great. introduce okay. themselves. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Good. Uh, I know <laughs> Professor Brees isn't here today, and I haven't seen uh, Budget Director Ashcroft either. So but just to let you know that they're also members, if that wasn't mentioned. Thank uh, you. So Amanda went over the um, CEFC forecast. Uh, so, which is great. And just a reminder that the revenue forecasting committee has to use the economic forecast from the consensus economic forecasting commission. So it's certainly an important input into the RFC's results. So we did meet uh, last Tuesday uh, for our formal meeting and reprojected general fund revenues up by 479.4 million for FY21. 241.3 million for FY22 and 219.2 million for FY23. Now, when we met last Tuesday, the 479 million in FY21 was, was roughly 461 million. But between that uh, meeting on last Tuesday and the end of the month on Friday, uh, we became aware of additional estate tax collections that had come in and uh, we had verified that were uh, correct and uh, revenue was in the bank. And so we did call a very quick uh, meeting of the RFC for last Friday morning to reproject state tax revenues up by approximately 17 and a half million. And so that's how we went from the 461 on last Tuesday to the now 479.4 million uh, as of last Friday. Uh, this is certainly a significant reprojection. And as the letter, last Friday's letter indicates, if we we keep on comparing these revenue forecasts that we've done since the pandemic started to our pre last pre-pandemic forecast, which was March 1st of 2020. And at this point, we are now $100 million higher in FY21 than we had projected back in March of 2020. And we're $153.1 million higher for the 22-23 biennium than we had projected back uh, last March. However, 
approximately 95.3 million of the 153 million in FY 22 and 23 is associated with the biennial budget uh, enactment and the reduction in revenue sharing from 5% to 3.75%. But again, even correcting for that, there's still, we're still projecting higher revenues in the 22-23 biennium than we were back in uh, pre-pandemic. Um, as has been the case uh, all along, most of the changes that we that took place or account for this reprojection are in the sales and use tax and the individual income tax lines. They are the ones that we've been trying to uh, forecast uh, that have been the hottest to forecast as we've entered the pandemic, worked our way through the pandemic, uh, and now after two major stimulus packages and uh, certainly a lot of stimulus from the Federal Reserve um, we, we, and a vaccine, we, we've now arrived at the point where uh, the changes for both of those major lines have, have have been bouncing around. It's really been a roller coaster ride, as as I know you you're aware of. On the sales and use tax line, the adjustment for this fiscal year is 177.3 million, and that uh, is a, a big piece of that is the fact that through March we were 75.2 million above our December forecast, and as of last week, the preliminary. April receipts pointed to a monthly positive variance of an additional $35 million. So with 10 months into the fiscal year, uh, we are well over budget on the sales and use tax line. And certainly with the stimulus that Amanda talked about through the American Rescue Plan, we have no reason to believe that uh, the last two months of the fiscal year are going to see any sort of slowdown and in the sales and use tax line. Uh, most of the FY21 projection is just the fact that we have just seen tremendous growth, particularly in consumer uh, good sales uh, in the, during the first quarter of this calendar year. It's, it's up 16.6%. Uh, we had started to see a real uptick in the fall and then it's just accelerated since the start of the year, no doubt uh, supported by the $600 checks that went out in January that uh, was enacted in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 in, in, in December of last year. And then the, the, the new round of checks, uh, the $1,400 checks that went out uh, in March and April uh, through the American Rescue Plan and then also, as Amanda pointed out, the enhanced unemployment benefits of $300 per week that were, was part of both the Consolidated Appropriations Act and the American Rescue Plan. All of that is going into uh, consumers' uh, disposable income, and they're turning around and, and spending it primarily still on goods, the, the service sector side uh, of the economy remains depressed. Uh, seeing a little bit of an uptick, uh, but nationally, when you look at the data, all of this spending is coming on the good side, which is like a, a fastball right down the middle of the plate for our sales tax base. Our sales tax base is still heavily reliant on the sale of goods, particularly durable goods, automobile sales, uh, appliances for homes, furniture for homes. And uh, that is just working out great for our sales tax right now. We're not heavily dependent on the service sector with, with the exception, of course, of, of meals and lodging. Um, but this time of year, meals and lodging aren't quite as, as important as they're about to be uh, during the summer tourism season. Uh, as we also note that an, another big driver of the uh, of this fiscal year's reprojection is the annual accrual that takes place at the end of the fiscal year. So we, we look out uh, 60 days into the next fiscal year, which is primarily July and August sales tax revenues, and we accrue back into this fiscal year any revenue that we estimate is coming from activity that occurred during fiscal year 2020. 
one. Last year, obviously, those were the low, you know, were very low points. And so we didn't accrue much last year. But with the recovery that's underway and, and our expectation that the tourism uh, sector is going to perform much better this year than, than last, that accrual is, is fairly, that net accrual is fairly significant this year. And that accounts for about 35 million of the $177 million reprojection for this year. Going forward, you can see on the sales tax for, forecast that it drops off quite a bit. Still significant reprojections up for FY22 through FY25, but not nearly as much as this fiscal year. And, and part of that is the one-time increase from the accrual. But the other factor is that we just don't believe that we can continue to see double-digit growth in consumer purchasing uh, particularly on in on the good sector uh, of the economy, that that has to slow. And the assumption is that starting in the second half of this calendar year, that will begin to slow. Uh, the other piece of that is there's still going to be a lot of disposable income out there, but we now think people are going to start shifting away from the good side of the economy back to the service sector side of the economy as the economy opens up. Uh, because of the vaccine, people feeling more comfortable going out to restaurants, staying at hotels, uh, maybe getting back to going to, uh, you know, a, a, a sporting event, a, a theater, any sort of a venue uh, that requires in-person participation. And, um, you know, so, and and of course, we don't tax a lot of those services. So, uh, we expect things to get back a, a little bit back to normal, and that's going to uh, result in lower increases going forward. Um, and I, I just quickly, uh, the assumption that bu is built into this forecast is that as far as prepared food and lodging sales, we expect to get back to where we were in 2019 during this coming summer tourism season. That's, that's a little more optimistic in December, but not all that much optimistic, more optimistic. And so it's not a huge part of the revenue reforecast, but it does, does feed into that a little bit. Uh, on the individual income tax side, uh, you know, quite a large uh, reprojection up for this fiscal year, $224 million. And again, a lot of that has to do with the fact that since our December forecast, we've just been running these monthly surpluses on that line for the most part. Uh, withholding growth for this fiscal year through April looks like it's going to be up close to 11% year over year. That is tremendous wage and salary growth for that length of time for 10 months. I, I can't, you know, I've been doing this for 24 years here in the state of Maine. I, you know, we, we've seen nothing like that sustained double digit growth and wage and salary growth. Uh, you know, even going back to the late 90s when the economy was was very strong, you know, maybe we were seeing high single digit growth for a few months or six month period. But th this is just tremendous. And of course, that's being fed by the additional unemployment benefits, uh, which are taxable, I'll, you know, uh, the um, $10,200 exemption that you implemented in the FY21 supplemental budget, of course, is coming through when people file their 2020 tax returns. But uh, on a monthly basis in real time, there is withholding that's being done on those additional unemployment benefits. And, and that's certainly helping the wage and salary line. And now you have the recovery starting to occur with a lot, some of those service sector areas starting to come open up expand, get ready for the summer season. And, you know, we've seen it on the state's unemployment rate and employment growth that those jobs are coming back. Um, the other area that played a big role is, as Amanda pointed out, the CEFC's forecast of wages and salaries and their forecast of uh, taxable unemployment benefits. Those changed significantly from December. Uh, certainly the rescue plan played a key role 
the three hundred dollar additional UI benefits extend now through essentially through Labor Day, and um, as Amanda pointed out, the, the strengthening economy is driving up wages and salaries as well, and uh, taxable income, wages and salaries. Uh, when combined with the UI benefits, that you know, that's seventy to seventy-five percent of our income tax base. So they they play a big role, and that's certainly leading to the the stronger revenue growth that we've we're projecting. Other factors on the individual income tax line: uh, we're assuming stronger growth in capital gains realizations uh, compared to our December forecast. Certainly, the stock market had a very strong year last year, despite uh, its correction early on in the calendar year because of the pandemic, it, it ended the year very strong. It continues to perform extremely well through the first four months of the calendar year. Uh, so we are expecting in 2021 there to be um, you know, additional uh, capital gains realizations. And then the forecast assumes that it'll level off and even start to decline a little bit going forward. The difficult part about capital gains realizations is it's a very discretionary source of income. And as you know, the president uh, is proposing fairly significant changes in the federal taxation of capital gains income. And so taxpayers are going to watch that very carefully to see if uh, the president's proposals get enacted in, in some form uh, when that tax increase becomes effective, does it have any effect on this tax year? Or are they all looking prospectively for 22 and on for those increases? And we, we know from history that when Congress either increases or decreases uh, capital gains rates, taxpayers will react. So it, it's possible if, if Congress were to enact a uh, significant capital gains increase at the federal level, and it was effective, say, for the 2022 tax year, we would expect to see a windfall at the state level uh, in 2021, because people will start uh, realizing capital gains uh, in order to get in at, at those lower rates at the federal level before the rate increase. So, so that could have another short-term burst uh, of revenue for us uh, later this year and early next fiscal year, but but we're gonna, it's gonna cost us down the road. So just to be be aware of that and and to watch that going forward and see what happens in Washington. Uh, slightly stronger growth in business income uh, that I, I know my Amanda touched on, and then uh, you know you you certainly made um, a significant amount of. Uh, took a significant amount of actions in the supplemental budget as far as state conformity to the CARES Act and the Consolidated Appropriations Act, and even to some extent to the uh, rescue, rescue plan through the unemployment insurance exemption for 2020. And certainly part of this forecast is our continuing adjustments to those estimates um, that, that we've built in here as well. So all of that is 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 helping out the uh, the individual income tax forecast. Again, going forward, we if we think things will settle down and uh, even out a little bit, and that's one reason that you, you know you're not seeing this continued two hundred and twenty four million dollar increase in um, the individual income tax forecast. But still, you know it's it's still in that hundred and twenty to hundred and fifty million dollar range going forward, still a, a substantial increase compared to where we were in December. So uh, the, the last thing I'll just say before I open it up to questions for all of us is just, um, you know, that there continues to be a lot of uncertainty on, on how the pandemic is going to play out, what actions are going to take place in Washington. The president has uh, proposed fairly significant packages around infrastructure and other federal programs that have uh, tax changes uh, uh, attached to them. Uh, so we're, we're clearly gonna watch that. Um, the um, legislature does have to, well, we would hope the legislature would deal with any conformity issues that came out of the uh, American Rescue Plan that was passed in the middle of March. And I, 
I think the governor and her supplemental budget will be making recommendations on conformity to, to that package. Um, and both commit uh, both the CEFC and the RFC have again committed to using all of the flexibility that the state statutes provide us to meet off cycle as many times as we need uh, to make sure that we're keeping you and the governor up to date on any changes that we're seeing in the economy and and therefore in, in state revenues. All right. Thank you, Dr. Allen, we appreciate it. Um, as I mentioned before, this is um, the first time through one of these reports for a good number of our newer colleagues on the Appropriations Committee. So um, we might have a lot of questions um, and we'll start with Representative Hymanson. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Allen. <clears throat> I, I'm, um, I'm thinking of this as boots on the ground for me because my district is uh, York, Wells, and Ogunquit, which are heavy tourist areas. And I have been just testing that in my mind about um, the um, spending transitioning to serve the service industry. Um, and I think that's right. You know, I, there's a lot of enthusiasm around here for this next uh, session season. In fact, um, um, there's a little bit of fear because of um, ability to hire people um, that might slow things down or at least um, make things a little bit more difficult. So I just um, want to tamper that enthusiasm a little bit because of our workforce shortage. Um, have you thought about that or is, does that come into your um, your economic forecast? So I think Amanda mentioned that that was a, certainly a concern of the CEFC and they cer certainly took that into consideration when developing the economic forecast. And we, we have to use that economic forecast in developing the revenue forecast. So in that sense, it has been built into the revenue forecast. Uh, having said that, we still uh, expect that the sales of prepared foods and lodging um, will get back to that 2019 level. Uh, that, that seems achievable to us, even despite the, the labor shortages that you speak of. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, and I, I have seen tremendous flexibility in, in all of our um, tourist industry um, they are really acting like startups and have more prepared foods that are ready to go. And even for this next cycle, um, you know, picnicking outside, um, fun stuff that um, I think will actually enhance the tourism industry as we go forward. So it's, that's been really exciting to see. Um, so I just want to mention that for everybody having such a bird's eye view here in my uh, district. Thank you. Uh, Representative Purse. Uh, thank you. I also think Representative Millet maybe had his hand up too, so. I was about to call on him. Oh, great. Good question. Uh, I have a quick question, yes. Um, yeah, the differential between um, the 461 of the beginning of last week and the 479 was because of the estate taxes that came in. Is it typical Correct. to like on the, within a week time sort of maneuver that change or why did you not just wait and have that included maybe in the next round because it was so significant or just curious about the timing? Yes, that was highly unusual. Again, I've been involved in this process for 24 years and I think it's the first time that we met so quickly right after you know the, the big meeting like that. And it was because in a very short period of time, we realized uh, that the estate tax revenues were going to be much higher than what we had uh, recommended to the committee on Tuesday and the committee had decided on. Uh, we wanted to take a couple of days to do our due diligence to make sure there wasn't some error in the deposit report. Once we confirmed that money was real, we, we just felt uh, that we needed to bring it to the revenue forecasting committee. It, the it would have been April revenue or it is April revenue. 
And in a few weeks, the commission will be releasing her April report. And we just felt like we should let the committee know and, and let them decide whether they wanted to include it in the forecast and, and they did. Thank you. Hmm. Representative Millett. Uh, you're on mute, Representative Millett. Story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Two questions, if I might, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, asking Dr. Allen to expand a bit on the um, flexibility and conformity comments that he made relative to the last paragraph of the three-page narrative. And then um, a second question, if I might later, is to translate what I'm hearing um, in terms of uh, real growth that we will have to deal with as a legislature uh, in the upcoming months. So on the first question, Dr. Allen, uh, do you anticipate utilizing the mid-year opportunity that we used last year for CEFC and RFC, possibly taking a look after the, um, the full brunt of the American Rescue Plan money is out there in circulation? And the second part of that question is, you referenced that the governor may be thinking about some conformity strategies and a change package. I wondered if you might expand upon um, those two questions relative to flexibility and conformity. So um, let me take the, the second one first. So the uh, American Rescue Plan passed in, in mid-November, I think it was a couple of days after the state's uh, supplemental budget was enacted. Um, Sorry, apply sorry um, Dr. Allen, you just said November. I think you meant March. March, I'm sorry. It was, right, thank you. Mid-March mid and uh, right after you had passed your supplemental budget. Um, and uh, it, it primarily affects the 2021 tax year. So yes, we would like to have the legislature weigh in on whether they would like to conform to the other tax provisions that are in that so that this fall when Maine Revenue Services is, is designing the 2021 tax years, we already have that guidance from the legislature. If, if we don't get any guidance from you by the time you adjourn the, you know, in June say, uh, then it's, it's difficult for us to, just, to know how to set up the 2021 tax returns. We're gonna to have to wait till you come back in next January. And, and as you know, from this last session, that's just too late. Um, so uh, I, my understanding is the governor will be providing you with her recommendations on uh, what items um, to conform to or not to conform to in the American Rescue Plan, and, and we would hope the, the legislature will you know, provide, uh, provide some guidance to us so that uh, you know, we're, we're ready with tax returns for the 2021 20, tax year uh, a year from now. Um, on your first question, as far as the flexibility and, and us coming in again for an off-cycle meeting like we did last year, I mean, I think what we're just trying to tell you is that we're continuing to watch this carefully. There's still a lot of uncertainty. And I don't anticipate personally that we're going to have to do that again. I, I'm expecting the next time the RFC and the CEFC get together is for our annual retreat that usually takes place in September. But if the last year has taught us anything is that we got to expect the unexpected. And, and if something unexpected were to happen, that both commit, uh, both the CEFC and the RFC members thought, gee, this is a game changer and we really need to get together uh, to make some changes. Um, where I, I think the, the, the law allows for that flexibility and we're willing to certainly act on that. Uh, and we're just like a year ago, if the governor or the legislature or this committee were to ask us to get together to consider something, I'm sure both com uh, the commission and the committee are more than willing to come in to, to take a look at things, to, to help provide you and the governor with some, a little more certainty uh, or as much certainty as we can. 
Thank you, Mike. And my second question really was, and Madam Chair, if you would indulge me, uh, I understand the, the reasoning behind making comparisons um, this May to where we were 13 months ago in the pre-pandemic way. But as I look at the fourth page in the summary, which is entitled a summary of May 21 revenue forecast, and I focus on general fund and highway fund particularly, is it, is my, am I correct, Mike, that when we look at the revenue picture from last December and the basis for LD221, the biennial budget, that we are looking at between the updates to fiscal 21 and the biennial numbers, an increase above the basis for the biennial budget of 940 million on the general fund and a reduction of 7.2 million on the highway fund. Am I reading this correctly? Yes. Thank you. I, I, I was surprised when I read the news following the meeting on the 27th, which seemed to talk only about comparisons of pre and post pandemic. And, and these numbers that I just did my own math on from your chart really paint a picture of where we are today on May 3rd versus the biennial budget for both general fund and highway fund that we received back on January 8th. And it is a stock change from my perspective. So thank you very much. Um, if I could just follow up to Representative Millett's question about the highway fund. Um, <clears throat> if I read the report correctly, you're your um, your explanation for that is that the fuel tax um, is lower. Um, and my assumption that goes with that is because of the pandemic, folks have been using less gas. Is that, um, is that a correct interpretation? Yes, I mean, uh, it, we've certainly seen quite a rebound and Amanda has those statistics someplace I know, uh, you know, her, her, the vehicle miles traveled has pretty much returned uh, to sort of pre pandemic, but it's still we're still seeing uh, gas tax revenues coming in, uh, I think we're 9% below where we were uh, a year ago through uh, March anyways. And uh, while we expect to see some improvement, obviously, over the next few months um, compared to a year ago, we, we still, you know, through 10 months into the fiscal year, we're, we're behind. And at least this morning, um, gas tax receipts in April are going to be under budget as well. So uh, certainly things have somewhat returned to normal, but uh, I'm probably a, a good example. I, I'm working from home. I'm not driving from the Portland area up to Augusta every day, even though things have started to open up. Uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of people like that that just aren't traveling or commuting like they were pre-pandemic. So I think we have to expect there's still going to be some reduction in, in gas tax revenues going forward. Thank you. Uh, a couple of folks have been waiting, Representative Fay and then Representative Arada. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is probably a newbie question, but does the date due for personal income tax have any impact on, um, is it more actual revenue versus forecasted revenue? Can you help me understand that a little bit? Certainly, it's a good, it's a good question because uh, as you know, this this year is unique again in the sense that uh, you know, the usual due date of April 15th has been pushed out to May 17th. And the whole purpose of having a May 1st forecast during the legislature's long session was that we usually have the April 15th filings in hand and we're able to give the legislature uh, and the governor an update knowing what we actually have for April 15th as you prepare to pass a biennial budget. Um, this year, unfortunately, we don't, we have a you know, decent amount of uh, information on, on April, 
uh, certainly better than a year ago. Um, but for instance, we are this month uh, currently $75 million under in April uh, for final payments. And the reason for that is obviously people don't, the return was due on April 15th. They now have until May. So, you know, we, we still anticipate um, even with that extension till May uh, that it's going to be better than we had anticipated back in uh, my, uh, back in December and that, you know, that revenue will be there. But uh, this maybe goes back a little bit to Representative Millett's question a minute ago. That's where the flexibility of our statutes come in. If in May, um, you know, it it's much it's worse than we thought, and it's substantially worse than we thought. Uh, the state budget officer has the ability to call the revenue forecasting committee back in to to make an adjustment if we think that's necessary or if it's substantially higher. Uh, we don't think that's going to be the case, but again, the system system allows for that uh, so that we can, again, keep, keep updating you and the governor as quickly as we can as things change. Um, before I go to Representative Rada, I realize, speaking of the budget office, that um, Beth Ashcroft has joined us. Um, Ms. Ashcroft, do you want to pop on and just introduce yourself? You're still on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Yes, Beth Ashcroft, State Budget Officer. Sorry, it's a little delayed getting on this morning. Glad you could join us. Um, Representative Arata, go ahead with your question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Oh, we've got too many microphones on in here. <laughs> um, I was one. Um, I'm wondering if Mr. Allen could tell me, give me a list of the tax conformity issues that we're going to have to deal with from the American Rescue Plan Act. I assume I assume that the unemployment income will be exempt again, uh, but what other um, issues are there? So uh, just touching on the unemployment exemption for just for a second. So that while that was part of the American Rescue Plan, that only applied to the 2020 tax year, just like the provision that that you uh, enacted in the supplemental budget. So uh, in a sense, we don't have to conform to that because we've, we've already done it on our own in, in the supplemental budget. Uh, the other big provisions that are in there uh, that are posing a conformity issue is um, they expand in the earned income tax credit, which we piggyback off of. Uh, they expanded the child and dependent care credit, which we piggyback off of at this in the state level. There was a, a, a provision that was providing, I don't have the details of it, but it, it does provide additional relief to restaurants. Um, that is a revenue reduction. There are some other programs that were part of the uh, CARES Act that they, they've extended uh, through the uh, American Rescue Plan. So those are the big ones. There, there's a few other small items in there, but the, the, the two big ones are the EITC and the uh, Child and Dependent Care Credit. Um, thank you. Will you be providing a report to the Taxation Committee? Yes, as soon as the governor uh, provides her recommendations, we will certainly have uh, detailed information just like we did uh, during the supplemental budget for the committee. Okay, thank and we will get a, a copy of that. So thank oh, you. Certainly. Yeah. Um, Dr. Allen, I'm not sure I fully understood your answer to Representative Arada's question about the UI exemption. Um, in the in the ARP, it exempted it for 20, for FY or tax year 2020. Correct. And we conform to that. Does it also exempt it for um, 2021? No. No. Okay. No. Nope. So it was 
if we keep our exemption, we if we roll our exemption into the next tax year, then we would be out of conformity. At the moment, yes, that's right. We would be okay. we would have a stand we would have a standalone unemployment exemption at the state level, not tied to any federal. Do you have you gotten any inklings that they might you know, do that again? Or is that still kind of too far away and you don't know yet? I haven't heard any information out of Washington saying they were, that they're thinking of extending that benefit. And the president in his speech the other night, you know, the White House released a fairly detailed package of his, I can't remember what he's naming his, his current package, but it, you know, it's mostly geared towards uh, individual income tax relief. EITC and uh, child care credits and so forth. I, I didn't see anything in there that talked about extending the unemployment insurance benefit. So okay, I, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions for our uh, revenue forecasting team? All right. Um, well, I'll repeat what I said uh, to. Uh, Ms. Rector, uh, Dr. Allen, it's a, it's a slightly happier story you're giving us today. So <laughs> we, I, I'll thank you for that. Um, uh, looks like uh, Director Nolan wants to chime in. Uh, I had, uh, thank you. I had indicated at the beginning that we would do uh, some kind of uh, summary of the impact on status, general fund status. Yes. Um, Thank I mean, you. I could I could present those tables and go through them with you if you uh, like to. But you know, basically, uh, the point is what uh, Representative Millet made is that we had just over a three million dollar estimated balance uh, upon enactment of LD seven fifteen. On uh, now we're adding nine hundred and forty million to that over the three years of revenue that will affect the estimated balance at the end of the next biennium. And so we would be at over 943 million. Um, sorry, I got choked up by that. Uh, 943 million uh, balance at the end of uh, 23. I, I can go over those, uh, uh, our uh, normal um, tables with you. Uh, we will post those as well. So whatever um, you prefer. Um, you have not posted a new status sheet, have you? Uh, I have not. I will do that right when okay. we're done. I do have one uh, I could show, go over with you now if you wanted to, but. Uh, um, uh, sure. I would, I think that's a good idea. Maybe in, you know, take about 10 minutes or so. Okay. Um, do you want, can you, are you going to share your screen or are you going to put it in the chat? What would you. Uh, I was going to share my screen. If that's okay. okay. Do you have that capacity at the moment? Um. I think I do. Do you have to allow me to? Uh, I might have to allow you to. I think um, we're all set. All right, why don't you go ahead and, and try? Uh, let's see. Uh, am I up? Yes, well done. Um, so uh, as I said, this is the um, general fund status through uh, LD 715. Uh, so we were estimating the balance of uh, 3.4 after uh, all the provisions uh, of the supplemental, which were in gray, and then of the uh, LD 715 biennial budget. Um, now, with the forecast just for 21 of uh, 479.4, um, you know, this is a, a nice tracking of all the changes that we have made um, since the passage of the biennial budget uh, two years ago, um, you know, including the negative. I mean, this is the, these through here is the pre pandemic estimate that we have been talking about the adjustment that we made in August, and then 
some changes legislatively, uh, then a positive adjustment in December, then the conformity and unemployment pieces in the supplemental, and then now the 479.4 um, that got us to 505 through the end of 21. Um, and then the three year, again, that same 479 and the 241 and 219, these three together is the 940 number that Represent Millet uh, referenced. Um, and so what was 3.4 uh, is now 943.4 with the uh, 505 that we saw from 21 carrying forward through the Dawson arrows um, to uh, update uh, the 22 and 23. So, so this is the supplemental, the LD 715 biennial, and then the May forecast. Uh, so everything has been enacted and approved. Um, there was a question whether we we're picking up the remaining pieces uh, of LD 221 that weren't included in 715 um, and were not in this uh, in this version, this is just the enacted um, to date supplemental biennial and then the revenue forecast to get to 943 uh, as the estimate. So that is all I had. If anybody has any questions on any of that, any questions for Mr. Nolan? <clears throat> Well, we certainly uh, know where to find you. And if more questions arise, um, we can dig a little deeper. Um, you will probably make a um, amendment to this yet again, once the change package uh, comes to us. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I mean, this version is just the enacted and approved stuff, but then like we do with every proposed uh, budget, we will do an estimate of the impact with that proposed budget. So uh, whether we add the remaining 221 stuff um, at some point now or wait till uh, we have that plus the change package, we'll probably wait to redo this till we have the change package amended, um, assuming that's what they're going to do is amend 221 with a change package. Uh, we would adjust this to reflect the proposed impact on, on this and then track it through uh, your consideration, et cetera, towards an Um <clears throat> Representative Hymanson has a question. I've just, where, where is this document? Did we get it or is it somewhere? Uh, the status sheets I have not post. Um, I, I will, as soon as we get off, um, it is, uh, on a, uh, what we'll have, I think we have a link of it off the appropriation materials, which we will, but there's a general fund um, impact in the OFPR website that has all of these updated status sheets, uh, so. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so we appreciate that. Any other, um, bits and pieces from the revenue forecast committee that need, we need to hear today. Um, Mr. Nolan, would you mind taking your screen down so I can look at the rest of the committee? Um, are you going to undo your screen sharing? That's what I need you to do. Well, I just figured out I could do that myself. Yeah, me too. That was exciting. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
Lots of power there. <laughs> yes. So um, are there any uh, questions um, from AFA members about what we just heard, um, what we're doing the rest of the week? I mean, I think generally what we're doing uh, after today is, is caucusing and continuing to work on committee report backs um, in the hopes that we can put together another list of initiatives from LD221 um, and have another work session on uh, Thursday this week. Um, so I think we have um, mostly caucusing for the next couple days. Um, and then we will be together on Thursday at 10 uh, to do some more voting on uh, some of the remaining report backs. Are there any questions from um, any committee members, the leads, my um, co-chair or our analysts, anything we need to add before we sign off? Uh, Representative Millett? Thank you, Madam Chair. I was wondering if uh, you might know whether we're going to get an updated uh, report back from criminal justice and public safety. We had a skeletal uh, report that didn't touch a lot of the items that were still outstanding. So I'm wondering if we're going to get another more complete update from them. Um. I think that um, Maureen is working on it, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Uh, I did I did reach out to the uh, criminal justice analyst over at OPLA, this was a little while ago, and asked her if, if she knew of that. And at the time she had said there was no uh, indication from the chairs of that committee that they were ready to uh, pick up and discuss the biennial budget again. I will ask her again today and see if there's been an update to that. But the last I've heard that they have not scheduled um, work on the biennial budget again. And they they were at one time, they, they had said they were waiting on a briefing regarding, I believe, youth um, imprisonment and change package. So I don't know whether they, and they did get, as far as I know, they did get some sort of briefing on uh, imprisonment of, of youth, but obviously have not received a change package. So I don't know whether they're waiting on, we're actually waiting on both things simultaneously. So I'll try to find something out today. Representative Purse. Yeah, thank you. Um, that was a great question, Representative Millett. I think we all wanna follow up on that. I just wanna uh, thank the team that we have in the revenue reforecasting group and the consensus economic. It's been quite a ride in the last 12 months for everyone. and been interesting to watch the ups and downs of this. So I appreciate this update it was a lot better than any of us really expected, I think, six months ago. And um, it's a pleasure to be sitting here today in this position. But I appreciate all the hard work and looking forward to getting our work going as well. Ditto. Um, uh, Dr. Allen looks like he's raising his hand. I, I just wanted to uh, say on behalf of uh, the Revenue Forecasting Committee, and I suspect from the Consensus Economic Forecasting Committee too, that we appreciate the support that the governor and the legislature has given us. I I, I fully understand it. It really has been a roller coaster ride, and it doesn't make your jobs any easier to have us bringing it down and going back up. But but that's the environment it's been in, and it, it's always nice to have the support of. Uh, all the people in that take this information and make the difficult decisions. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any further uh, questions before we sign off for the day? All right. Um, well, thank you all for joining us and um, we look forward to being back together on Thursday, May 6th at 10 a.m. for a work session.